Hello, everyone, and welcome to week number three of Geology 100 Lab. This is a very exciting week. Um, our topic of this week, as you can see on the screen here, you're going to be looking at chapter 10, uh, which is interpreting geologic structures on block diagrams, geologic maps, and cross sections, which essentially we can boil that down into structural geology. Now we'll talk about that term in a little bit. Now last week we talked about plate tectonics. So this idea and this theory that Earth's surface is broke up into a discrete set of hard rock slabs that we call plates, right? Now they all move in relationship to one another in many different ways. Um, we talked about the forces that drive us, that drive plate tectonic, which is mantle convection. For today's topic, we're going to talk about the aftermath of plate tectonics, right? The things that are occurring on Earth's surface as a result of plate tectonics. Now, we talk about the movement of plates, thus the pushing, the sliding past, and the ripping apart of this continental or oceanic crust must have a large effect on Earth's surface, and it does. On the screen here, we see this mountain. So how do we go from these flat lying plates to very large structures like this, this giant mountain, all right? And that is gonna be um, the theme of this week and this week's topic, which is structural geology. Structural geology is a scientific discipline that studies how rocks deform through time. Now in this class specifically, we won't go into super detail about the mechanisms behind structural geology. However, I will give you a little bit of a brief introduction to it um, so that we can further grasp the different formations and structures that form as a result of deformation, um, small scale and large scale deformation. In Geology 100 Laboratory, we're more concerned with how we can identify geologic structures um, in a 2D realm, so on a map. However, if you are in my lecture, we do go into more detail about the actual 3D workings and how structural geologists can envision deformation in the third dimension and in 3D structures. However, for this class, we'll be mostly focusing on how we can identify on maps and what we call block diagrams, which I'll get into. So deformation changes the character of the rocks and is often very easy to see. So on the screen here, you can see in the left-hand picture, you can see all these little structures here. And what do they look like? Little bends. Now in structural geology, we call those folds, right? You probably see another term on here that you've probably heard before, which is a fault. Um, now a fault, as you know, as much you all know, we live on and very close to a very famous fault, which is the San Andreas Fault. Now faults are essentially an offset of rocks. Those are going to be the two most important things um, as far as deformation goes that we're going to talk about in Geology 100 Lab, which are faults and folds. So deformations are the permanent changing character of some kind of rock unit um, due to stress. So stress is some force that's applied per unit area. Now we study structural geology and we're studying deformation, which is the change of the character of the rock units that we see. We are only seeing the aftermath of stress. We never actually see stress. So as structural geologists, we infer stress based on the deformation that we see. Now the permanent deformation that we see, another term for that we call is strain. So when you stress something, you strain it. And so we see the strain. And so strain deformation would be like the faults and the folds that we look for and look at in this course. Now deformation, like I just said, revolts, results in some kind of permanent change to the original state of the rock. And we're gonna talk about two main deformations and that is called brittle deformation and ductile deformation, all right? So imagine a rubber band, all right? What happens when you were to pull that rubber band, right? You would pull it and it would essentially, like an elastic band, it would spring, all right? Now let's say you immediately let go. Now, if you're holding out to it nice and tight, um, it will just go back to its original shape. Or it may you know, zoom across the room, depending on if you let that rubber band go. Now imagine if you were to continue applying some stress, some force to that rubber band, all right? And you pull it so hard that it snaps, all right? Do you think you can put that rubber band back together so that it can be its elastic like it was in the beginning? Or is it just permanently ripped and broken? The permanent ripping and broken, we call that strain, right? So that rubber band, it has reached what we call its elastic limit. 
its ability to pop back into its original shape. So in that case, it has ripped, it has broken, right? And it has snapped on some area of the rubber band. That rubber band has reached its limit, all right? The same thing with these rocks. Once it reaches its elastic limit, its ability to essentially, you can move it and mold it and apply some kind of stress to it, but then it goes beyond its limit. It's taken as much force as it possibly can. So it will either break like a cookie or it will bend like a metal spoon, all right? That cookie, think of it on the screen here, is brittle deformation. A good example of brittle deformation that we'll look at in this class is faulting. Now faulting are some permanent breaks in Earth's crust along which some movement has occurred. Brittle deformation, this cracking like a cookie, occurs at lower pressures and lower temperatures which means that we get faulting in Earth's crust, but it's not gonna be way down deep like some of the other deformation that we'll talk about. The other type of deformation, like the bending of our spoon, is our ductile deformation. An example of a ductile deformation that we'll talk about in this class is folding. So rocks that are deep underneath Earth's surface, they tend to deform under stress. And in this case, if they're deep, so they're, they're subjected to high pressures and high temperatures, instead of breaking, breaking like a cookie, they're gonna essentially bend like a spoon, all right? So they're not essentially gonna crack, but they will bend through time. So if you apply enough stress, enough force to some kind of rock, and it's under pressure for long periods of time, it can either all of a sudden brittly break and deform, and it will fault, or it will ductily form and bend like a spoon, all right? But unlike a, a rubber band, it's not going to just pop right back into its original shape. It's going to deform permanently. It's going to strain permanently. So let's say we have a rock unit that faults and it cracks, all right? We can know that it was applied under some kind of stress that was at low pressure and low temperature. Because if it wasn't, it would have folded. It would have ductily deformed. So based upon its strain potential, how it's strained, we can infer the type of stress that it was in place under. The type of brittle deformation we'll talk about in this class are faults. You've probably heard of faults before. Now, faults occur within the crust at lower temperatures and lower pressures. Faults are essentially, you apply some stress to some kind of rock unit, and it will essentially crack like a cookie. So you apply enough stress to the point that it can't take any more stress. It has reached its elastic limit and it just automatically breaks. That sudden slippage, we call that faulting. And we'll talk about three main types of faults in this class. Normal faults, reverse faults, and strike slip faults. Before we jump into those, let's talk about what faults are um, and what faults look like. We categorize and identify faults based on the orientation of the rock units on either side of the fault plane. Now the fault plane being the actual area where the slippage has occurred within that fault. So in this case on the screen here, we have a few terminologies I'd like to go over. The first one are fault blocks. Each block is essentially the rock units that reside on either side of the fault plane. That being the area where the slippage has occurred in the first place. That sudden movement, that line denotation where you see movement on either side of that fault plane. On the left-hand side of the screen, we have what we call one of the blocks, which is the football block. It is called the football block because A, it looks just like a foot, and B, for the most part, it is the block with respect to the other block, which we'll talk about in a second, um, and the football block doesn't do any movement. So for the purpose of this course, imagine the football block is the block that remains stationary. It's the hanging wall block the block that's on the other side of the fault plane adjacent to the football block that does most of the movement. So we have our football block, which is stationary, that looks like a foot, and we have the hanging wall block. The faults are identified by what this hanging wall block, what exactly this hanging wall block does in the first place. Does it move upward with respect to the football block so it looks like it's getting pushed up onto it? Or does it drop down, like, like it's moving away and getting ripped apart from the football block? That's how we identify different types of faults, the three main types of faults within this um, topic here. The first kind of fault that we have is the normal fault. Now, the footwall block, remember it remains stationary, 
the hanging wall block moves down relative to the foot wall block in a normal fault. The reason being, imagine you were to have these blocks and push them back up, but you were to apply some stress to it. So let's say you're trying to rip this block apart. What do you think is gonna happen? All of a sudden you apply some stress to this block and rip it apart. They almost look like they're getting pulled away from one another. In this case, that's essentially what happens, where the hanging wall block's gonna get pulled down with respect to the foot wall block. The next kind of fault we have is a reverse fault. So unlike a normal fault, where the hanging wall block moves down relative to the foot wall block due to extensional stress, the pulling apart, in a reverse fault, the hanging wall block moves upward with respect to the foot wall block. So this occurs in a compressional environment. When you have um, stresses that are being pushed toward one another, so the, the maximum direction of stress is getting pushed towards one another. So the hanging wall block is gonna get pushed up. Now, depending on the actual angle of this fault scarp or this fault plane can determine whether it will be a reverse fault or a thrust fault. So a thrust fault is essentially a low angle reverse fault. So it looks like it's just gradually getting pushed up on top of the block. It is considered a thrust fault when that angle, how the angle, the steepness of this hanging wall block with relation to the foot wall block, if it's less than 30 degrees, it will be considered a thrust fault. If it's greater than 30 degrees, it will be considered a reverse fault. The last kind of fault orientation that we have is a strike slip fault. Now you probably know a very good example of a strike slip fault, and that is something we live very close to here in Southern California, which is a San Andreas fault. Now a strike slip fault is when the two blocks are sliding past one another. Now this occurs with, she with shear stresses. So those are the three main types of faults we'll talk about in this class, which is normal faults, reverse faults, and strike slip faults. The last kind of deformation that we'll talk about is ductal deformation. Now, unlike brittle deformation, ductal deformation occurs deeper down in Earth's lithosphere, so at higher pressures and higher temperatures. And unlike brittle deformation, it's not gonna crack like a cookie. It's gonna bend like a spoon because it is in place under higher pressures, which means that there's more material that's on top, so it's less likely to break but also it's under higher temperatures, which means that the material is gonna behave more like a fluid than like a very cold rock that will just crack and break. A good example of um, ductal deformation that we'll talk about in this class are folds. Now we're mainly gonna look at large scale folds. When we get into metamorphic rocks and metamorphism, whether you're in my lab or you're in my lecture, metamorphic rocks display a type of texture, essentially the way the rock looks and how each one of the minerals are aligned within that rock, they display a small scale type of fold and we call that foliation. But on a large scale, we call those folds. Just like here on the screen. So you can see we have these two scientists that are standing in front of this very large anticline and syncline formation. You're probably like, what is anticline and what is syncline? But don't worry, we'll talk about that. So in folds in time one, imagine we have flat rind rock. Now, just like our faults where you apply some stress to it, whether that is compressional stress, whether that is extensional stress, or whether that is shear stress, let's say you apply some compressional stress. That means you have two plates that are colliding together, right? So you're being squished together, which means you're shortening the material that's around it. But unlike our fault, unlike our cookie, where it's just going to break in half, and then some location on that rock unit, these rocks in place under higher pressures and higher temperatures are more likely to ductally deform. They're going to bend just like our spoon. And we call that large scale bending when it's permanently bent. And even when you remove the stress underneath it, and you expose this formation, that bending is going to be imprinted. It's going to be strained forever. And we call that a fold. Now, just like when I talked about our faults, we also can identify our folds based on the orientation. Now, just like the faults and the fault blocks, we based our folds based on the orientation of the limbs. 
So imagine you had a fold here, like on the screen, and you were to cut that fold in half. Now on either side of that halving of that fold, we call each one of those sections the limbs. So the limbs extend outward from the very center of that fold. And we call that center of the fold either in its planar form, we call that the axial plane, or we call that the hinge, the area where on either side of that axial plane or the hinge, the limbs are gonna be in some orientation with respect to that axial plane or that hinge essentially that halfway point between each, um, each of those limbs, so the halfway point of that fold. The limbs with respect to that center point of that fold can either point downward or they'll point upward. Now the pointing down or the point upward would be considered two different types of folds, which I'll talk about. Now the two types of folds we have are an anticline and a syncline. An anticline looks just like an arch where you can walk through where a syncline looks like a trough. So in anticline, the oldest rocks are exposed in the center of that fold, just like here, but the oldest rocks we have here on the bottom. So if you were to stretch, stretch these units out, all right, or on the very bottom, we would have these flat line sediments that were the oldest deposited. And then they, then they get progressively younger as you move upward in this formation. Where in the center of this fold, now we have the oldest rocks. An anticline, just like an A, looks like an arch. And then we have a syncline, where the youngest rocks are exposed in the center of the, form, of the fold. And it opens upward just like a trough. And the limbs on a syncline are pointed upward. So anticline, the limbs are pointed downward. And a syncline, the limbs are pointed upward. Anticline for an A. That's how essentially I remember it. Now in this class, these are essentially just the basics, right? These two types of folds, an anticlines or a synclines. But you can also get other types of folds, like domes. You can also get craters that form. As you move on in this PowerPoint, you'll learn about some of the other types of folds too. Monoclines, you'll learn about chevron folds, all these different types of things. But for the basics of this course, I just want you to be familiar with the difference between the faulting and the folding how they both form, the environments in which they form, but also how we can identify them in this 2D formation. Now these two main types of structures, faults and folds, geologists, we can depict them in many different types of ways. For the most part, we do it in either a map view, so looking right down on the formation. So a geologic map or the map view represents some location on the Earth's surface and the structures that are represented by what we have mapped out through time. We can also depict these formations and these structures in a cross-sectional format, which is essentially like we were to take a vertical slice from the very top on Earth's surface deep down into Earth's core. In this course, we're gonna be combining both of those views, the map view and the cross-sectional view into what we call a block diagram. Now, a block diagram is essentially a three-dimensional depiction um, and representation of both a map view um, and a cross-sectional view. So on block diagrams, we can depict the map view, which would be on the top of this three-dimensional structure. And we can also see different kinds of cross-sectional views. So on a block diagram, we can see a front cross-sectional view, and we can also see a side cross-sectional view as well. The purpose of the following exercises that I've given you and assigned this week are to help reinforce um, and understand the various geometries of these geologic structures, so those being the faults, um, normal fault, reverse fault, and thrust fault, um, as well as a strike slip fault and also the types of folds, and the main ones being the anticline and syncline. And they also help reinforce how we can depict them as geologists in map view and cross-sectional view, and thus combining them in block diagrams. So as you move along in the exercises throughout this topic and this week, please return to your various sections within your laboratory manual of chapter 10 in order to help you work your way through these assignments I also encourage you to take advantage of the animations that I've also provided in module three for this week as well. So that being said, 
go on, go forth, and good luck as you now venture into the beginnings and an introduction of structural geology.